Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Krishna. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here in Chennai, and I'd like to thank Dr. Vijay Kumar for inviting me over. And indeed, it is a, a huge privilege to be sharing a podium with Dr. V. Mohan on the same stage uh, and discussing on a one-to-one -one basis a uh, slide uh, a paper that has changed our clinical practice. And uh, I will be taking you through this review article, which is a unified pathophysiological construct of diabetes and its com complications. It's written by somebody called Stanley Schwartz, published in Trends in Endocrinology and Metabolism, published last year. Um, Krishna had let down a, a, a diktat that, you know, it had to be within the last one year. So this is something that has really impacted me because I think it shakes your comfort zone in telling you that what we have been used to for the last 50 years or 60 years or maybe even 100 years, insulin is not all that good for you or for your patients with diabetes. And why is, it, why is that? Because now I think the diagnosis of diabetes or the pathophysiology of diabetes is centering around what we know as the beta cell centric mod uh, model. Due to a variety of genes, uh, and epigenetics which work on it and the environment, inflammation, immune regulation, insulin resistance, all these are coming back to the common cell, the denominator, which is the beta cell. And the beta cell starts to fail, leading to insulin insufficiency, which in turn leads to glucolipotoxicity, which is basically building up of glucose and toxic lipid particles inside the cell. To fight this, to fight this entry of so much of glucose and lipid inside the cell, the cell takes a barrier. It tries to stop this entry of glucose and lipid into the cell. Now from basic physiology, we know that it is insulin which facilitates the entry of glucose and lipid inside the cell. So all the cells pick up a protective insulin resistance. It prevents insulin from working and entering more glucose and more lipid into the cell. If this insulin resistance is overcome by usage of sulfonylureas of high dose or high dose of insulin, then the insulin resistance fails and therefore more glucose and more lipid manages to enter the cell thereof, leading to more toxicity of the cell. And this is what is glucolipotoxicity, and this is the basi basic premise of the development of beta cell failure in diabetes. And what does this do? This intracellular fluid, uh, the fuel excess, that is glucose and lipid being excess, leads to cell tissue damage and dysfunction, by the generation of ROS. ROS is reactive oxygen species. Oxygen, as in O2, is good for you. But the moment this oxygen is present in the form of O3, which is superoxide, or peroxidase, or hydroxyl, which is OH, or a single oxygen molecule, which is O, these things lead to toxins generated inside the cell and this process which we all know as oxidative stress. And all these things in addition to the insulin resistance, the dyslipidemia, the hypertension, the inflammation inside the cell leads to diminished insulin secretion and beta cell mass and failure of the beta cells. What is interesting to note is this oxidative stress is spoiling the RNA and the DNA inside the cells preventing the gene expression. And this process is not restricted to the pancreatic beta cells. This is taking place also in the heart. It is also taking place in the retina. It is also taking place in the kidneys, which is why you will note that people who have poor glycemic control, they have microvascular complications and macrovascular complications. Indeed, you will notice that people who have nephropathy have a higher incidence of heart disease. You will notice somebody with nephropathy has a higher degree of retinopathy. You will notice that somebody with a higher degree of retinopathy, particularly in type 1 diabetes, has a higher degree of strokes. So 
This process is replicated not only in the pancreatic beta cells, the, the glucolipotoxicity leading to generation of okay, uh, reactive oxygen species, and in turn leading to more complications. And this is what has led to the beta cell centric construct of the egregious 11 with pancreatic beta cells leading to reduced insulin, reduced in creatinine effect, reduced alpha cell defect, reduced glucagon, hyperglycemia, leading to glucosuria, the brain coming into the picture, and insulin resistance in liver, muscle, and adipose tissue, increasing glucose, immune dysregulation, the colons coming into play in the stomach and the insistine with reduced amylene, and this is now being targeted by the pathophysiological treatment of diabetes, which is, you know, you use insulin resistance for uh, metformin TZDs, glucagons for alpha cell defects, for hyperglycemia from the kidney SGLT2, dopamine agonist, DPP4, GLP1s, and pramlinide. Interestingly, you will note that all the drugs that I have described out here and the egregious 11 being addressed is also, you know, look at kidney SGLT2 inhibitors, look at the benefit from the Emperage outcome. GLP-1s all over the place, look at the benefit from all the leader trials, etc. Even if you look at the brain, dopamine ag agonist, you know, the bromocryptine. Bromocryptine is actually the first drug in a RCT to show reduction of MACE. So all these drugs which are looking at the pathophysiological construct, addressing the beta cell function and addressing this pathophysiological defect are also addressing the complications and reducing complications of diabetes. And this, I feel, ladies and gentlemen, is a paradigm shift from the usage of insulin alone for the treatment of diabetes. These drugs address the pathophysiology in a more robust way, thereby treating the disease itself and thereby reducing the complication rate, uh, rates associated with the disease. I thank you for your patience. Like, uh, we want to start the discussion from you. How has this changed your practice? Okay, now, um, for me, uh, insulin was the messiah. You know, if things went wrong, I always looked at insulin, and there was nothing else that uh, I looked at. And it was a comfort zone. Oh, if somebody's got a problem, I'll give them insulin. But this has changed. You know, even if I do use insulin, I shudder to put people on high doses of insulin. I shudder to put people on high doses of sulfonylureas, and I'd rather, I'd rather try newer drugs. I know they're expensive. I know there's a problem with them. But in the long run, I feel that they have actually changed the way we deal with diabetes nowadays because we are now looking at reduction of complications and treating the pathophysiology of diabetes at the same time. Yes, yeah, please, please. Yeah, I think, Binay, congrats. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, just I would like to draw your attention. I'm sure you were there in the 2015 IDF, wherein I think Del Prato, who has given us the construct of the legacy effect, if you remember right, he was participating in a debate. I mean, it's a very, very, you, anybody can criticize this concept. It is highly open for discussion. He compared the outcome of ACARD and other trials with the Empire at that point of time. Similar to what you said, in ACARD, ADVANCE, or all the other trials, what happened when there was the glycemic target was to achieved, we updated the dose of insulin, the secretogogues, etc., pushed all the glucose into the cells, made them metabolize, generate good amount of ROAS with its own. So it is tempting to speculate that when it comes to handling the substrates, maybe it'll be better off to drain off the substrates by your SGLT2. I mean, it's a concept. Uh, of course, many people agreed to the concept, but few people had their own. So this is in tune with what you have presented in the sense that when you deal with hyperglycemia, mere updating the dose of conventional modes of therapy like insulin and secretogogues, you will achieve your target blood sugar level, but at what cost? Yes. Can I drag Dr. Mohan into this? So on the one hand, the obvious construct of this is saying, let's address multiple pathophysiologies, right? This is one hand. On the other hand, is something that you like, which is the Weng data and its thing, which actually says, look, don't do any of this. Start them on multiple subcutaneous doses of insulin or continuous doses of insulin for the first three to five 
weeks and then you have remissions for two years. So how do you reconcile these two views, Dr. Moore? So I think it depends on the stage of the presentation of somebody with type 2 diabetes. So when you diagnose somebody with type 2 diabetes, we had a meeting yesterday, we were discussing there are about 6 to 7 percent of people who already have retinopathy at the time of diagnosis and neuropathy. So obviously they've missed the bus for a very long time. They also come in with A1Cs of 10, 11 and so on. So just giving them two or three of these oral drugs, I don't think is enough to hit hard enough at the time of onset. And that's where, as Krishna said, I think this uh, short course of insulin seems to do wonders. And we have seen improvement in beta cell function occurring. C-peptide, which is very low, almost suggesting that they have a LADA or something else, bouncing back once you give them insulin. Question is, if you give multiple uh, doses of oral drugs, can you achieve this? Well, there are trials going on and wa we'll wait for it. But I think it's simplest to give insulin. In that context, even giving something like a GLP-1 analog for a short course, I don't think is going to work because these things work in the long run. But I think the point is well taken once you've crossed that and then you have some people go into remission, at least they end up with better beta cell function. And then in the long run, as you go on, it's a natural history of the disease, one of progression. Then it's better to use multiple drugs. I remember right from my uh, college days, when we first tried the trials, both in dogs, when I worked in the Madras Middle College, as well as clinically with my father, where we showed that using a sulfonylurea and metformin, and that time penformin, those are the only two drugs that we had at that time, using half the doses of these drugs worked better than doubling the dose of an individual drug. And that is the first one I know, 1976-78, where the first ex uh, uh, combination therapy which we use, because we're using two different drugs now. Obviously, when you use three or four, you'll get the same effect. But the point is that at the end of the day, when insulin is needed, there is nothing to replace insulin oh. when all the drugs fail. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, my point, Dr. Mohan, is, you know, uh, the Wang data which we all depend on or the Israeli data that came up at that point of time is now dated because it was a long time ago and we didn't have these kind of drugs, powerful drugs to compare it with. Um, number two is, it was a very small data. It was very small numbers. I, I'm sure all of us in our clinical practice at least see a lot of patients saying, doctor, we, I'm not going to take insulin, come what may. And indeed, if you put them onto even metformin and sulfonylurea, you find that they're doing very well, even at seven or eight years. But that is probably the natural history of diabetes in itself. But uh, so, you know, I'm sure insulin will hold its place in the treatment of diabetes for as long as we are alive. My contention now is that I think it is time to give insulin a little bit of a shake. You know, I, I think it, insulin needs to come out of its comfort zone. So that is all that I'm proposing. So anyone wants to shake, Dr. Sinha, no? It's got a glucotoxicity. The glucotoxicity comes only when a glucose enters the beta cell. The insulin is required for the transport of glucose from outside to the inside the cell. Here there is no question at all. It is insulin independent tissue. The glucose already entered. Having entered inside the cell, it should get metabolized by the enzymes. So there is no role of insulin over there. So if that is the case, your blood sugar is high, you utilize the glucose by the other tissues like muscles and fat and all these. So you prevent the, bring down the glucose level in the serum, so the glucose toxicity comes down, the damage to the pancreas comes down. So in the, in the event of high blood sugar, so I think better to give insulin to control, you can take the metabolic control like that, bring down the glucose, the glucose reverses because it goes with the diffusion, it is because it is metabolized by the GLUT2 receptors there in the beta cell, whereas GLUT4 only require insulin for the transport. If that is the case, whether insulin is better or other drugs are better, sir. Okay, so this is the traditionally held view, what you've said. Now, the point is what they are saying now, I didn't, you know, this is of course a very five minute presentation and I missed my time also, as Krishna said. But the point is, there's also some known as re redux metabolisomes. Right. I don't know if I've managed to pronounce it well. The moment the pancreas is under threat, the reactive oxygen species and things like this, they have a messenger mechanism. Foxo. Sorry? Foxo. Yeah. And that's actually telling all the cells around the body, don't take glucose. Don't take glucose. So what is happening is, 
the focus remains on pushing, trying to push more glucose into the cells, which are already very highly laden with glucose and lipid. And all these glucose and lipids, particularly the lipids, I think it's more the lipids than the glucose, which generate a lot of toxins inside the cells, leading to cell destruction, apoptosis, and uh, worsening of outcomes of the cell. So that is, that is the mechanism. Vinayak, thank you so much. I think we need to move on. We'll, sir, we'll just move on and we'll come back. One comment, very brief, please. Uh, it is very interesting to note, I'm not touching about your penicillin, uh, insulin controversy. It's very interesting to note your pathophysiological construct from the slides, what you have projected. And uh, Dr. Mohan, please listen. And the various drugs involved in the pathophysiological construct, the whole thing looks very theoretical. Are you understanding? Are you locating? Are you identifying where the pathophysiology is wrong and treating the patient? Even today, you are, you are in a game of trial and error. It is in Tamil, it is like Kilijosium you are treating. But the wait, way you wait, break wait is Wait for my talk there, I'm going to talk.